Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Stephanie with Scientists in Every Florida School and today we're stepping into the garden, a virtual series presented by Mount's Botanical Garden and the Scientists in Every Florida School program. Today's topic is unlocking the mysteries of Easter Island, the road to scientific discovery. This is part two we're excited to present. Scientists in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The CEFS program connects and builds long-term partnerships between teachers and scientists in order to bring current scientific research and big data into Florida classrooms and beyond. My colleague Brian and I are super excited to have you with us here today. Mount's Botanical Garden is a nationally acclaimed attraction for Florida residents and visitors alike with a mission to inspire and educate through nature. I'd like to introduce to you Rochelle and Joel from Mount's Botanical Garden, who are going to take the reins from here to explore the garden with us a bit before we introduce our special guest. I'll let you all take it away. Um, hello, um, Mount's Botanical Garden is a 14 acre botanical garden in West Palm Beach, Florida. The garden's focus is on educating gardeners on the practical and aesthetic use of tropical plants in the land. We are also hosting um, a permanent installation of replicas of the Moai statues from Easter Island. Next slide. In this, in this slide, you see the site where the um, Moai are going to be constructed and an example of the diagram of their construction. The two big palms in the background are Puerto Rican hat palms. Since the Jubea palm that was once um, populated Easter Island does not grow in South Florida, we got another uh, palm that is um, a large skirt. The Jubea palm is actually one of the largest um, palms in trunk diameter of any palm, going up to four to six feet in diameter. Our, um, Here's a display of actually when we had to move those palms into the site. And you see the scale with the, the people staying around, just how large they are. They're pretty dramatic. So I'd like to introduce our um, speaker today. It's Carl Lipo. Lipo. He is the Associate Dean of Research and Programs in Harper College and the Professor of Anthropology at Binghamton University. Originally from Wisconsin, Carl received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Arts at the University of Wisconsin, and he finished his doctorate at the University of Washington. His research focuses on the intersection of evolutionary theory, anthropology, and prehistory. He has conducted archaeological field work using remote sensing and geophysical techniques in a wide range of locations around the world, including the Mississippi River Valley, California, Guatemala, Pakistan, and Greece. For the past 15 years, he has worked on Easter Island and other areas of the Pacific, studying the spread of human population across Eastern Polynesia. He is also an entrepreneur, co-founding allrecipes.com. At this time, we would like to introduce you to our scientist, Dr. Carl Lupo. Good morning, everybody. Let me share my screen. Oops. Um, here we go. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone's having a good day today. Um, I, who am I? I'm, a, I'm Carl Lippo. I'm a professor of uh, anthropology at, the, at Binghamton University, which is located in upstate New York. Um, it's cold up here. Uh, we just had a whole bunch of snow. And uh, I think everyone around here is thinking fondly of Florida at this moment. Um, my own research, I'm an archeologist. Uh, That's my, my background. I do a lot of different things. And archeology span is a, um, you know, interesting thing to be because you get to study lots of cool places and lots of cool uh, uh, things about the world. So what is archeology? span uh, Just quickly. So you get a sense of the kinds of things that we're going to talk about today. Um, archaeology is the study of the past. We, we try to figure out what happened in the past and why did it take place in the way in which it unfolded. Um, we look for clues to tell us what happened. Um, we, so what we do is we go out in the world and we sort of study things and we uh, 
try to puzzle out what must be the case in order for what we see to be true. Um, and we ask a lot of questions. A lot of what archeologists do is say, well, why is that? How did that get there? When did that show up? Um, why are these people doing these things? What is that artifact? Uh, how do we use that? Um, and I wanna talk about today a little bit about a cool archeological uh, case of really interesting things, which are gigantic statues. Um, and, and as an archeologist, we, we study these things, trying to figure them out, try to understand how they work. Now, I just to mention that as um, archeology span is something you can learn to be, there's ways of getting training in archeology. span um, you can participate in, in um, local areas where they do excavations, they dig and look for things, they map things. Um, usually you can do that at museums. Uh, there's often summer programs, but it's something that as, a, as if, if um, people listening, is something that you can learn to do and ultimately you can become an archeologist uh, and, and be, you know, become a professor or work in a museum or uh, work for the, for the federal government or the state government. So why do we do archaeology? It's, it's always a good question because you know these days there's a lot going on in the world, uh, and you know why we worry about the past. The past is over, right? So why do we care about the past? Um, well, for my own, I, you know, my own purpose, I study the past because just like this fortune cookie, which is one that I actually got just last week, um, that the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. But the past, understanding the past and how it got to be the present enables us to understand the patterns of human behavior, the patterns of history that allows us to understand, well, what could happen in the future? What, what drives, what could the future look like? And it's sort of surprising to think that the past tells us about the future, but I think that's exactly why archeology span is important. That our understanding of that, of humans, however, wherever they, and whenever they, they did things, um, provides us a general understanding of human beings. And I think that's useful uh, and helps gives us a lot of guidance for the future. So that's why we do it. What I'm gonna talk about today is a really cool new uh, feature that's gonna be present at the Mounts Botanical Garden um, that illustrates something in archeology. span And I want you as, as um, um, to, that when you go there, when this new exhibit opens, that you have particular insights and that you approach this new feature with in inquisition and start to ask questions about it and, and give, have some understanding that I don't think everyone will quite, quite have one, uh, as we talk about this. So it's gonna be really exciting. So here's a rendering of what this will look like, uh, just a real sort of a general uh, 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 graphic of what you might see when you go to the Mounts Botanical Garden. And you can see some extraordinary things, gigantic statues that have these curious giant red things on top, giant hats on top of them. And the statues are interesting in shape, they've got uh, big heads, uh, arms, curiously shaped, they're positioned in different places. Um, and the question is, well, what are these things? Um, what, where, what did, where did they come from? When did they, who made these things? When did they appear? Um, come on, here, <laughs> where are they? Where are they from? Uh, we ask questions, what are they? Um, what, what, what do these represent? What are the features about them? What's, what did people do to make them? How did they make them? How did they get to where they were? How did these statues appear um, um, where, where they were found? Um, and ultimately, why did people make them? What, what did, why were these things something that people spent time in the past making? So these are the kinds of questions that archeologists ask. And it's the kind of work that I've been doing on Easter Island, the place where we find these things um, for the past 20 years. So it sort of characterizes what an archeologist does. And it's the kind of questions that I think are good to ask about everything. You know, you should always ask, where did that come from? What, what, what is that thing? How does it work? And why does it appear? So I'm gonna first start with where. So let's start with the first question is, where do these things come from? Uh, where these, certainly we don't see these everywhere in the world, uh, but where do, where do these particular giant statues come from? Well, interestingly, these giant statues occur on a tiny island out in the middle of the South Pacific. Uh, way out here. And if you notice that where the arrow is pointing, um, it's in a place where there's no other land. It's thousands of miles off the coast of South America, thousands of miles from other islands like Tahiti and other islands. It's a really remote spot in the, in the middle of the South Pacific. Uh, sort of an interesting place to find things like gigantic statues. It's found in an island called, that's known often as Easter Island or Rapa Nui as the local people uh, call it in the, in the uh, indigenous language. Rapa Nui, um, it's a tiny island. It's only about 14 miles by seven miles. So 14 miles across, 
seven miles in north south, a tiny island way out in the middle of the Pacific. So it's often called Easter Island. It's actually, it's a territory of Chile, a South American country, but it's thousands of miles from Chile out in the middle of the Pacific. And once you get to this island, this is all there is. Um, it's just this place, seven by uh, 14 miles, which is really a small subset of uh, Palm Beach, if, uh, the town, the city of Palm Beach. How did people get there? Well, people didn't fly. Uh, what we know archeologically and ethnologically is people took canoes, that people um, had constructed sailing canoes uh, and ultimately starting in Southeast Asia over a period of several thousands of years, probably 5,000 years, uh, people moved from island to island, exploring the Pacific, finding islands and ultimately arriving on Easter Island. And they've had really remarkable sailing technology. And what we've learned um, through the study of the patterns of how of when people moved, uh, the distance that they sailed, that they were really remarkable sailors who were able to go vast distances and find tiny islands uh, and do well. So they, and they sailed, these canoes probably look something like this, large double hulled canoes uh, containing lots of stuff for colonists who were bringing uh, food and animals to islands so that they could, uh, they could colonize them. So how did they get there? Um, so sort of the story, just to understand is how they got there, is that people started, some, sometime about 5,000 years ago, people left uh, areas of Southeast Asia in these double hull canoes uh, and started exploring some of the near coast islands um, um, along uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, north of Australia um, and, and sort of slowly expanded across the Pacific uh, eastward. About 3,500 years ago, 3,500 years ago, uh, people got to uh, Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa, which are fairly large islands um, that are uh, remote, um, but um, uh, you know, that supported people for quite a while, about a thousand years. At some point, interestingly, after several thousand years of sort of pausing um, in, in uh, 1200 AD or so, people left Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa, and then found the rest of the Pacific. And in the same event of sailing that, that led people to um, Easter Island or Rapa Nui, people got to uh, Hawaii, they got to New Zealand, um, they got to the Marquesas, the Austral Islands, and other islands in, in what's called East Polynesia. And that happened about 1200 years ago, or 12, 1200 AD, about 800 years ago um, in the past. Interestingly, there's evidence that people actually sailed all the way to South America uh, and then came back uh, to Eastern Polynesia, bringing the sweet potato. The sweet potato um, is actually a domesticate uh, of South America that ends up in the, in the Pacific and Polynesia. And these sailors were so good, they were able to sail all the way to South America uh, and bring this uh, vegetable back to um, Polynesia. So here's the chronology that we know of for these uh, people living on Easter Island. Humans arrived about 800 years ago, they're sailing from other islands uh, to the west on canoes, thousands of miles of open ocean, really remarkable sailing. Our own understanding, sorry, from a European perspective of, of Easter Island or Rapa Nui, uh, comes at, begins really about 1722 AD. So much later, after um, 500 years of people living there, Europeans arrive on the island in 1722. Uh, the first European that we know of that arrives on the island is named Jacob Rogovin. Uh, he's a Dutch captain, and he arrives on the island on Easter Sunday. Uh, and because it was Easter Sunday, he called the island Easter Island, uh, which is what we often know it today, although the local people call it Rapa Nui. Here's the island um, itself. So if you go to the island today and you can fly there uh, from Santiago, you see uh, this island, as I said, 14 by seven miles. Uh, you can see the entire island, it's a small island, uh, and it's isolated with no other islands around it other than these small rocks that are nearby. Now, I want to mention something important here is that there are people on the island today, uh, people who are descendants of Rapa Nui, people who arrived there in 1200 AD. And you can go there and talk to people who, who live on the island. Uh, and there's a living, thriving culture of people on East Island or Rapa Nui. Uh, they speak Rapa Nui, the language, uh, and, and carry a lot of traditions that, um, that go back deep into the past. So if you want to ask uh, descendants of uh, the people who built statues, you can go there and talk to people at Rapa Nui. Now, I should mention, this is a, um, a, a festival that, in which people are um, participating in cultural events, dancing and um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, sort of a celebration, a festival. Um, people aren't necessarily, um, here we go, uh, you know, living in, in sort of some 
the prehistoric condition that island itself has a modern town with roads and cars. Uh, people are Chilean, they speak Spanish. Um, and you know, when you go there, you can stay in hotels, go to restaurants, and um, but uh, they still retain a lot of cultural traditions uh, and language and other kinds of activities that 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 are have these roots deep in their their ancestors. And here are some of the local kids who are helping us out and doing some of the surveys that we were doing um, of Easter Island when we went there to look at some of these statues and try to figure out uh, figure them out a little bit, try to understand their history and their their source. So, what is it about Easter Island? What are, what are these things that are that are found on Easter Island that we're going to see at the Mount's Botanical Garden when the exhibit is made? So, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of things, some couple of details here um, that when you go to the go to the, the preserve to the botanical gardens I want you to pay attention to uh, first looking let's look at the overall statues themselves and ask uh, what are these things let's look at some of the details look at the faces we'll look at some of the hands here and then we'll look at these curious features called uh, pukau that are sitting on top of them and these are all rep going to be represented in the botanical gardens um, but I want to give you some little special insight into them well these statues uh, that are known on Easter Island of Rapa Nui are called moai M-O-A-I, Moai, which are, uh, this is just the, the indigenous name, the Rapa Nui name uh, for these large statues. So everyone calls them Moai. And you've seen probably photos of these and images of them, these very stoic figures looking out across the horizon, um, sort of interesting and curious in shape. Um, and, um, and, and these are really the famous thing, that famous artifact of Yistran that is going to be part of this exhibit. Now, these things are massive. That's, it's hard to appreciate how big these things are are. Uh, they can be up to three stories tall, um, you know, 30 feet high, the size of three-story buildings, and they weigh up to um, up to 70 tons, which is the weight of a Boeing 747. Uh, if you can imagine this gigantic statue uh, weighing as much as a 747 made by people on Rapa Nui um, living on this tiny island or boat in the Pacific. These, the sort of, the, the striking size and magnitude of these things, given the small size of the island, makes them particularly curious and mysterious. And people have wondered, how could people have done that? Why would they do that on this island? Now, there are nearly a thousand statues on the island, which is another sort of mind-blowing aspect of Easter Island, is that they didn't just make one of these things, which would be remarkable, but there's nearly a thousand. Many of them are um, in different, you know, are, aren't all finished. Some of them still are at the quarry where they're carved, and those are the, the blue triangles. Uh, many of them are along the coast, which is uh, the orange, uh, the, sort of the green dots, um, and some are found along roads. And I talked a little bit about uh, these different kinds of statues, the different locations at the last time we did uh, this uh, talk about Easter Island, uh, but uh, nearly a thousand statues. Now, I talked a lot about some of the other sort of broadly statues um, and, and, and their movement at the previous uh, session we did. Um, but I wanna talk about a couple of interesting features that I think you wanna pay attention to when you look at these, these uh, statues, uh, particularly when they get end up at the, uh, at the Mounts uh, Botanical Gardens. One of the things to look at is the, the eyes of the Moai. Many people don't sort of recognize that statues actually, some statues have eyes, not all statues do. When we look at the quarry, uh, which is known as Rano Raraku, a quarry where the statues are carved. Statues are um, have a curious um, uh, shape. Um, let me get the laser pointer. When you look over here, the stat there's are there are no eyes here. It's as though the eyes are closed. You just see an indentation where um, the eyes would be. Um, so right there, sort of interesting things. But when you look at the statues that made it to the green dots, the ones that are along the coast, which are actually put on top of giant platforms, we'll talk about called Ahu, the, the, the statues actually have eyes carved into them. And if you look here at one of these closed statues, you can actually see that these eyes were carved inside of this, the face in order to have something put inside of them. And that makes them different than the statues that were at the quarry. Uh, once they got to the platform, the places that they ended up uh, being put, uh, people in the past carved sockets into the eyes, and then presumably it would look like they put something in um, to, to turn, the, turn these statues on so that they looked at the community. Well, it turns out that people, archaeologists excavating on the island, have found the remnants of the eye sockets, the things that were put inside of the eyes um, for these statues that made it to these platforms. 
uh, my colleague Sergio Rapu was excavating in this is probably the 1980s um, at a beach site called Anakena, and he uncovered this coral inlay that fits exactly into the eyes of the statue. And then pupils that were put inside of red rock or sometimes black obsidian black glass that were the eyeballs of the statues. And it was at this point when they get to the, to the it was only when they got to the platform where they were the place where the statues were put, that the eyes were carved in and the eyes were inserted so that this, these statues became alive uh, for the community. Here's, um, uh, uh, this is a, obviously a modern photo, not a historic photo, of a recreation of people turning the eyes on of the statues, um, the Moai of Easter Island. So what often we see these statues, particularly at the quarry, and we don't get the sense of the eyes because in fact, they didn't have eyes. At that point, they're sleeping and their eyes are closed. It's when people transported them to these platforms when they were stood up for the community that the, the, the ancestors were turned on and the eyes were placed in. And then these statues served to oversee the community uh, and to provide guidance for, the, for, for them and the actions of that community. Here's an example of a statue uh, that you can go actually today, they, the eyes are put in there permanently. So you get a sense of what these statues would have looked like with their eyes on. Uh, quite a different view than the statues um, that are at the quarry with the closed eyes. A um, couple other details I want to look at. These, these statues um, uh, are at a, a site called Ahu Nau Nau, which is on the north side of the island. Uh, they have really great preservation and have lots of interesting details that I think are worth looking at. Um, that these aren't just statues themselves, they have lots of interesting carvings. Down on the bottom of the statues, the arms are down along its side with its hands on its belly, and you can see the delicately carved hands in, in these particular statues. All of the statues ultimately had hands and arms like this. Many of them are, are eroded um, and, and you may not be able to see them. So, I'm, um, so not all of them are represented in, in terms of the, what's left of them. But when we do get good preservation, we find lots of interesting details in the statues like a belly button, uh, as well as uh, these long hands of, of the arms around its belly. And keep that in mind because when we compare our, these statues with other statues on, in the Pacific, we're going to see a lot of similarities. The backs of them also have details. So we sort of look at the backside of this, this same ahu and we zoom in on one area. We can actually see evidence of carving here uh, that represents clothing. In fact, this is a, a tie that is made on the backside of the statue uh, that represents a sort of a loincloth that would have been wrapped around the individual uh, and the backside where it was carved. So there's lots of interesting details representing individuals in these statues. Um, we also see evidence of tattoos. Uh, this particular statue is an interesting one. Uh, when you look at the bay behind it, you can actually see these swirls here, uh, which are representative of tattoos, in addition to the string that was part of the loincloth that, that the individual was wearing. Um, also, I, so that's sort of quickly to sort of see that since it's a little vague, um, there's these interesting spirals and those are undoubtedly tattoos. And of course, Polynesian tattoos is still a tradition that people uh, do today uh, that have their roots deep in the ancestors of people living on Rapa Nui. I should point out one thing that just notice here. If you notice, there's sort of a, a I should say, a, um, a buttocks on this particular statue with this area below it. What that represents is something really interesting. The statues seem like strangely shaped, almost inhuman in the way that they're just the torsos. But in fact, there's actually evidence that these statues are kneeling just that the legs that they're kneeling on are very, very, very short, uh, almost to the point in which they're missing. And on some statues, you can still see sort of an indication that these are ind kneeling individuals um, that are sit kneeling up on this platform looking at the community. And we're gonna see in some evidence of that. It's sort of interesting to compare with other statues a bit. So keep that in mind. Now the statues I mentioned themselves, these Moai, weren't just made and then moved around the island on their own. They were actually made um, uh, I mean, they were, they were made and moved around the island, uh, but they weren't just sort of randomly scattered um, uh, by themselves. They were brought to platforms on which they were then placed by uh, pre-contact people, Rapa Nui people. Uh, these platforms are called Ahu, A-H-U, which are gigantic stone monuments built for statues to be placed on top of. And this one here, this series of statues, which is the largest sort of reconstructed uh, Ahu on the island, is named, is known as Tongariki. Uh, each of these statues are, you know, 30 tons, 
Um, they're they're multi-story buildings in size, and you can see there are 17 statues here, uh, some of which had these interesting hats on top, which we'll talk about. So these platforms themselves are incredible con constructions, uh, but the, they are the places on which the statues were placed, and then the eyes were carved into them. And in the botanical gardens, we, we'll see uh, a couple of statues sort of on a platform-like um, substrate, which will reflect sort of this Ahu setting that statues end up on. This is, again, looking back at Ahu now now, and you can see that one with the interesting buttocks and kneeling statue, the ones with the carving around in the buttocks. Uh, here's the, the uh, platform on which it was standing. This is the Ahu uh, that these statues uh, placed on. What's interesting about some of these Ahu, and you sort of look at the details as an archaeologist, so you look at interesting things like carvings of figures on some of the Ahu, but we can also see something really interesting here. This particular Ahu, uh, this platform is actually made of pieces of older statues uh, that were on a platform that predated this statue that fell down, broke, and then was used as material for um, new, uh, a new uh, platform. And here's a close-up of that. You can see that it was on the platform because you, the eyes are carved into it. It's an older statue with a rounded head, probably didn't have that um, hat on top of, uh, that ultimately was an old platform that fell down and the statue fell down broke, and then they use that to build this new platform in which we find these statues um, on top. So interesting things, history and details of many of these platforms um, to look at. One of my jobs as an archeologist is to document this kind of thing, looking at the details of platforms, how do they get constructed? What are they made of? How big are they, et cetera? And we use lots of interesting fun technology to do that, like this uh, quadcopter uh, that we use to hoist a camera to take photos of uh, platforms um, here's some photos that we take of some of these platforms, some of these Ahu, uh, so that we can document their sort of construction and their layout. Now, one thing I should mention is that the statues that you see standing up, like at Tongariki and the Ahu, uh, now now, which is behind me, um, are actually reconstructed. That the statues at, at some point in historic times had all fallen down uh, and that they were re put back up only relatively recently, since the 1950s. Most of the Ahu around the island, and there are several hundred of them, um, have statues that are fallen down and they look something like this. So as an archeologist, this is a really interesting opportunity to look at the way you know, that this sort of set up, looking at them sort of in an intact setting and to try to figure out what sets of events must have come together in order to, to, to do, make this view. So we use these copter photos to look at these statues. And you can see here's a statue, with this interesting hat on top. We can see a platform here on which it used to stand, but the platform has additional features. This Ahu has this big wings that are additional stones. And there's lots of interesting history and features to these uh, Ahu that we study. Um, here's a, here's a, a video we took of one of the Ahu, this is Ahu uh, Tatenga um, on the um, uh, south coast of the island. Um, and you can see um, a statue fallen here a large, this large rectangular platform. A lot of effort actually went into the Ahu. The statues are actually one small, in some ways small feature that are placed on top of these platforms. Uh, there's a lot of effort that went by pre-contact by Rapa Nui people into making the platforms themselves. Um, another thing to notice here is the platform, this Ahu is right on the coast. Um, so really right on the edge of the coast um, where people were able to access resources like marine resources to get fish, uh, to get actually fresh water and other things. Um, that's very common to find these uh, platforms on the edge. And I should also notice that the statues, uh, when they stood on these platforms, were facing inland. Uh, they're not facing the ocean. They're not warding off anybody out to sea. They're actually, uh, the, the statues are facing the inland to the community and the people of the, uh, that, that participated in making the, the, these platforms. So um, that's a little bit. So we have giant statues sitting on gigantic platforms. Um, the question you might ask is, how did people do that? How is that possible that people um, were able to make those gigantic things on this tiny island? Uh, so let's look at that. Um, well, one thing we know we, we can study is the fact that there's a place that many, most of the statues actually come from, a quarry called Rano Raraku. And it's located right here this, in this crater that's in the south side, sort of eastern side of the island. This is the, the crater. It's sort of a, a big um, a volcanic um, well, it's a volcanic vent 
um, that has a stone that people from which people carved the statues. It's uh, Rano Araku, the statue quarry. Let's let's zoom in here a little bit uh, to see that. And you can actually see when you go to this go to the island. It's a really spectacular place to visit. Uh, you can see statues that were carved from the quarry sitting at the bottom, and these are the ones that you often see just the heads of, with the rest of the statues being buried. Um, places from which the statues were carved at the top. Um, so we can learn a lot about statues from looking at Rano Raku. And we can walk across the quarry uh, and look at uh, different, different statues in the state of being constructed. We can find statues that hadn't yet been detached from the stone uh, right in the cliffs of, of the quarry. Here we have a statue that's being carved right out of the bedrock. Um, here's another statue, just to give you an indication. Of, and there are hundreds of these where we have two statues actually side by side in the state of being carved out of the cliffs. Now you might ask yourself, how did people carve the rock out of, what did they use if they didn't have metal tools or lasers or some other kinds of machine? How could in these, these people who are living on this island in this remote place carve them out? Well, we can look around as archeologists and say, let's see if there's evidence of tools that might do that. And in fact, we can find on the ground that there are rocks. Uh, these are called toki. They're hand axes, essentially, rocks that are slightly denser than the material that they're carving from that are actually on, around the quarry. Uh, and you can look at them and see the wear patterns on where they were, were worn down as people chipped away at the wall to carve out these statues. We can look at the walls themselves as well and look at the evidence of the little chip marks uh, that these, these hammers uh, did with, as people bashed the rock in order to carve out the, the material that led to the statues. And as archaeologists, we spent a lot of time um, studying these kinds of details to figure out the puzzle that, that led to these to the Moai. Doing that, we've come up with sort of an understanding of the, of the, pro, of the steps involved with carving the statues at Rana Raku. First, the statues are carved high up on the cliff, as it turns out, um, uh, carving the top first and then underneath. They're slid down and ultimately into pits that are at the base of the, of the, of the quarry. And those ones that are in the, in the pits are the ones that you see with just the head stick, sticking out. This has led to a lot of work that um, my colleague and I did to understand the, 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 how did the statues get from the quarry to the Ahu places. Uh, in the previous lecture, I talked a lot about that. And the surprising answer about the movement of the statue is that the statues are actually walked. They were, they were basically rocked back and forth in a standing position using ropes um, that allowed the statues to be easily, remarkably easily, moved from, from uh, across miles of the island uh, to the places that they ended up on the Ahu. Um, and I'm not gonna go into that detail since we talked about it last time, but I'm, you, you can see that on the lecture that was recorded, or I'm happy to answer questions more about that. What I wanna talk about today, because I know this question came up last time is, well, well if they move the statues that way, how did they get those gigantic hats on top of them? What are those and how did that happen? And we've been working on that problem as part of our research um, on the island for the past couple of years. These hats are called pukau. Um, they're hats, they're not, these aren't often talked about as top knots, um, but really they're hats. They're additional things that are added on top uh, that, that uh, pre-contact pre people put on top of the statues, on many of the statues, not all the statues, but many of them. There's probably about 70 pukau around the island that were. That, uh, so there's about 70 statues that had these hats on top of them. Uh, these hats are made out of stone. They're made out of a different stone than the statues themselves. And they're massive, they're huge, and they weigh, they, they're at least the size of the weight of a car. Many of the statues had them, um, I said about 70. Uh, some of them are well-preserved like the ones at Ahu now now. And here's, you can say there's really nicely preserved statues here with eyes carved into them, uh, interesting details of the ears. Um, but these big pukau sitting on top of them. So we've been doing studies of the pukau, trying to figure out, well, what was necessary in order for people to get these on top of the statues that they walked uh, uh, to these ahu. One of the things we know is that the statues were, that the pukau were actually um, in their raw form as cylinders were rolled like giant wheels of cheese uh, across the island. And we can find remnants of, this, of these pukau, these large, massive red uh, stone material um, on the island uh, in places where they were left as they were being rolled across this island. So of course it makes sense if you've got this giant cylinder thing, moving it easily would be, one way to do that would be rolling. Interestingly, the quarry for these things are at, is on the other side of the island. It's called Punapau. It's a different uh, a, a crater 
and this, the, uh, the hats come from, from Punapau and then are rolled across the island um, to, to places at the Ahu where they're put on, ultimately put, carved and put on top of the statues. Well, how did they get them on top of the statues is, is, probably, is a very good question. If they can easily roll them, how did they get them on top? Well, from our studies of the wear patterns and the, the sort of shape of these pukau, uh, we think our best explanation is that these were, these were moved using what's called a par buckle, which basically consists of taking a rope, uh, wrapping it around the cylinder, and then from the top, pulling the, the, the pukau up, the, up a ramp to bring it to the top of the statue, par buckle. Uh, par buckling is sort of a common way, sort of a, it's, it gives you a mechanical advantage, a two to one, essentially for every amount of energy, you get two amounts of energy return in terms of pulling uh, an object up or rolling an object up a hill. Um, to do that, of course, you'd have to have a ramp. You'd have to have a big ramp that would be go to the top of the statue. Um, and, and so we reconstructed what a, such a ramp would look like. It would have to be not too steep um, and it would have to be fairly long to get to the very top of the statue. Um, interestingly, the statues have to be tilted forward in order to be finished. So it's at this point where the statues would be completed when it was leaning against a giant ramp that the hat would be put up on top uh, and the whole thing would be assembled and the ramp would be taken down. Um, is there evidence of that? Yes, in fact, there is. Uh, we can go to one of these ahu where we've taken photographs and see, in fact, the remnants of a ramp uh, that once uh, provided access to the top of a statue laying here. And in fact, we have a pukau sitting at the bottom of this. And the ramp, the distance of this ramp and the height of the ramp would have allowed people to bring this material, this bring this pukau, par buckle it up to the top of the statue. Sort of an interesting, um, ingenious way of, of constructing these statues using the resources that were available on the island with, not, with as little labor as necessary. Well, of course, the big question that you're probably asking is, well, why would people do this? Here with this tiny island in the middle of the Pacific, uh, we're gonna see these things at, at, you know, in, in, this, um, in the Mount's Botanical Garden. And we're gonna ask the question like, well, those are weird and interesting, but why would people do that? I mean, here they're, they're decorative in the gardens, you know, they sort of highlight this interesting feature, uh, but why did people originally do them? Why did they carve this, invest so much energy into making these things? And why these particular shapes? What, what is it about these shapes and the way these representations uh, that would make people do this? So question, good. It's one of the things that archeologists do is ask lots of questions. Why do we find um, uh, Mohai and Ahu on Rapa Nui? Well, there's turns out to be, there's, there's always more than one answer. And it's not that one answer is best, it's just they answer different aspects of the question in terms of why. Uh, so th there's definitely more than one answer. Uh, one answer that we can say, and I'll talk about this quickly, is the cultural traditions of Polynesia. Uh, Polynesians um, have particular traditions that this is part of, and the and Rapa Nui people are Polynesian. We can also see that on the island, uh, these statues represent ancestors. So the Rapa Nui tradition is that these things are representative of ancestors and that you honor your ancestors. And finally, we can look at the fact that the, the presence of these statues, particularly constructing them and moving them, particularly on Rapa Nui, has a benefit to the community. Thus, is something that is, is particularly important on this particular island, given the constraints of the island. So three kinds of answers. Um, so when we look at sort of the traditions of Polynesia, we can see that Moai um, are, are um, you know, part of Polynesian traditions. Um, that, that in Polynesia, you, you, you honor your ancestor and that the Rapa Nui Moai represent ancestors um, and that you put the statues um, uh, uh, on these ahu in order to face the community and provide guidance for the community. And it's a very common Polynesian tradition. When I talk about Polynesia, I just wanna reference back to that map. Easter Island or Rapa Nui is part of a set of islands that we call Eastern Polynesia. It's a large triangle of islands that have people who are quite, quite related to each other. Because in fact, they all emerged out of Fiji, Tonga and Samoa and colonized the, that area of the world about the same time, thus having a common heritage that they shared essentially great, great grandparents uh, and shared traditions uh, as part of that migration. We can actually see things that are very similar to Easter Island, although we often think of Easter Island as being unique and distinctive. In fact, we find features like um, uh, Ahu and, and statues on other islands in Polynesia. We just call them different names. Uh, in in um, Tahiti, uh, New Zealand, 
uh, we call these kinds of platforms that um, uh, we call them Marai. In Hawaii, they're called Heiau. On Rapa Nui, they're called Ahu. So the different words are actually referring to very similar kinds of plat stone platform constructions. Uh, Rapa Nui just has its own variant of that. Um, we also see that other places in Polynesia have statues. Uh, the statues on Rapa Nui, as we know, are called Moai, but on Hawaii, Tahiti, and Marquesas, they're called Tiki. Uh, so essentially, there's different words for very similar kinds of things put in very similar kinds of places on top of platforms um, where you would rep they would represent ancestors and you would honor them. They just happen to have different words, but have same cultural tradition, same source of heritage uh, among them. We can actually look at some of the interesting features of different statues and find that they're, they're, even though the statues on Easter Island are, are you know, remarkable in size, they do share other features with other Polynesian place that makes, other pla Polynesian places that make statues. Um, they have their hands on their bellies. They're often kneeling or have these small little legs, um, sort of uh, um, very stylized design. And we find these stone statues of various sizes across the Pacific um, that are really related to the statues on Easter Island. There's not as many of them, they're not as big, um, but they're, they're part of the same tradition of Polynesians making star and statues that represent ancestors. These, uh, these statues actually on, on Rabi Vavai, which is in the Austral Islands down here, are actually, are really interesting. They're, they're about 12, uh, 10 to 12 feet tall. These are very large stone statues, very Moai-like. Um, share features with these, you know, arms around the belly that we saw on the Moai, um, uh, but are, you know, more significant than people realize. So the statues, while we often think about them as weird and different on Easter Island, are actually part of a version of something that we find commonly across Polynesia. And interestingly, not all the statues in Easter Island have like no kneeling bits to them uh, or legs. Uh, there are statues like uh, here, this is Tuku Tuturi, um, Tuku Turi, is a, is a kneeling statue found near the quarry at Rano Araku that is very different than the statues that we find um, that, you know, at the Ahu because it's actually an early statue in which the legs are still present, uh, that we can still see the kneeling part of the legs that ultimately gets stylized down until we can't even see them anymore. Still the hands, the bellies, and this very similar face, uh, no eyes because it hasn't met, met it to the Ahu yet, made it to the Ahu, uh, but very similar to in, in shape and form to these other Polynesian statues like that at Ravi Vavai. Now, the, the, the last part to the question, and I'm gonna finish up here so we can get to questions, um, is sort of, well, why, if those are the traditions, why is Easter Island so elaborate in the, the degree to which that people, that people made and, and built moved statues? Why do they spend so much time uh, making so many statues when other islands, they didn't do so many. They did make them, but they're not, you know, there's not a thousand of them and they're not three stories tall. Uh, what we'll find, actually, this is the research that I've been doing for the past 20 years, is that the statues, it turns out, and, and, and really curiously, are, are most likely to be, be uh, a, something that people did because it provided benefits to the communities living on those islands. That living on a remote and tiny island in the Pacific requires people to gather together to share resources and cooperate, and that the act of making and moving statues provided a successful life for people that lived on this island for 500 years, at least until Europeans arrived, uh, with very limited resources and no option. Once they got to the island, they basically had to deal with the resources that were available there because everything else was 2,000 miles away and you couldn't just run to the store to get something. You had to share stuff with your neighbor, you had to cooperate, and these statues helped the community cooperate. Um, what we find is that, you know, those communities, essentially those communities that cooperated with one another um, and shared resources, as well as competed, sort of comp com competed over the act of moving statues, did better than those communities that did not. And this is part of ongoing research, trying to understand the context that led people to, to make these statues and to um, invest so much in them. And the question I have to ask is, well, is this, is this weird or is this something that we do ourselves? What modern examples might we have of people cooperating and competing in a community sense about particular activities that strengthens the community by doing so. What examples might we have? And I think we have a really good one that we can point out, which was recent. Football, football is a, is a community event, is a, is a group of people who have particular identity, share that identity, gather together, uh, root their team on, um, by sharing those, that, that the idea of football, 
um, at a local scale, it brings the community together and making everyone stronger as a result of that. Who actually wins? Well, in this case, maybe the right people win from people in Florida. Uh, that, that doesn't matter so much, but the act of the competition and the cooperation and the identity bringing people together really makes a difference in terms of strengthening communities. Uh, and that's so football is actually an example, sort of a modern example of the kinds of things that would seem weird to people outside, but make perfect sense when you're in a community and you realize the value that these kinds of things happen. For Rapa Nui people, this was making and moving Moai. Uh, it was a cooperative and competitive uh, event that brought the community together. So what have we learned about East Island? What are you gonna be able to go do when you go to the Mounts Botanical Garden? Uh, well, a couple of things. One is that these things may appear mysterious, but we can explain them, that they're, they're not as mysterious as they might seem at first glance. We can look at the details and we can figure out the sort of things that went into making them, how they moved them, and even understand why they were moved. Um, our research, when you look at the details of the statues, shows that these statues were walked, through cow were rolled, uh, and that they were moved in these really ingenious ways um, that didn't require crazy resources and were perfectly in scope with the island itself. Um, it didn't take that many people. It was, it, was, it was done by the islanders using what they had available to them. Um, and we can learn that these Moai actually helped the communities out. They helped them in the past uh, in terms of bringing community, the individual communities together. It helped them by having sort of competitiveness that enabled them to um, uh, sort of strengthen their own communities. Uh, and it helps them today, Rapa Nui people, uh, find a lot of value in these statues because this is their identity, this is their cultural tradition, and it brings their community together and strengthens them. And so if you go to Rapa Nui, you can talk to Rap Rapa Nui people uh, and understand their perspective and the value that they have about their ancestors and what their ancestors were able to do. Um, so I hope that you all uh, get a chance to go to the uh, Mount Botanical Garden and enjoy this new exhibit. And I hope when you do so, you can look, take, you know, sort of visit that place and understand it with a greater degree of detail than you than otherwise you might be able to do. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things about these statues, lots more mysteries that we're still working on, lots of details to do. I invite everyone to, uh, um, to, to participate in that, and I'd be happy to answer questions if you've got any. Thanks so much, Carl, for another really fascinating presentation. I, I know that I really enjoyed it. Uh, I could tell our students do by their engagement as well. So sort of going in the order of your presentation, a question that we got a lot from the beginning from our students was, what else do archeologists research and study besides Easter Island? What, what else do archeologists do? Besides Easter Island? Uh, um, uh, that's a good question. We, well, what's the great thing about archeology, span we study, we study our, our, our sort of expanse is the past. And there's many, 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 many dimensions of the past, each of which each region has its own history, its own sequence of events, its own sort of relationship to the environment and the, and the areas in which people live. Um, and so what's great about being an archeologist is that we get to um, sort of look at these different histories and sort of put, sort of understand them in those own contexts. So for my own work, I work on East Island. I also work elsewhere in the Pacific and Hawaii. Um, I also uh, work in uh, Eastern North America, down in South uh, Louisiana and the Mississippi River Valley, each of which, each of these areas have its, has its own history uh, and provides different sort of insight into the, the workings of the past. Uh, so it really is this fantastic, it's the you, sort of a unique discipline where we get to study a million years of human history across the world and, and we get to decide sort of what's, what we're gonna focus on at any point in time. So now transitioning back into Easter Island, why do only some statues have hands or belly buttons? Ah, good question. Um, well, most of them probably did. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we look at the ones that are well-preserved, they all have hands uh, and they have belly buttons and they have tattoos and details. The problem is that these statues, uh, once they fall down, they, they may be face up or face down and they, they get eroded. Essentially the stone is not super hard uh, so rain, um, animals, horses will rub against them, people, um, sadly, um, and so a lot of the features will sort of go away on their own. So, um, so really, we have to look at the most preserved ones to sort of see the details that probably all of them had at one point. Well, sort of along the same lines of their, their body structure, their appearances, um, do archaeologists see anything on there that may resemble tattoos? And if so, what do those look like? Uh, tattoos on the arms or which, um, 
I haven't really, I don't know if I've seen tattoos on arms. They tend to be body tattoos, the ones that we see on the statues. And I think that's mostly because it's a broad, on, from a statue perspective, a broader canvas for putting statues versus a small area and an arm where you only got an upper surface. Um, I suspect when we look at sort of ethno-historic European observations of, of Rapa Nui people, when, they, when Europeans first arrived, we see tattoos sort of everywhere, very similar to what you'd see in you know, Polynesian people today. Uh, tattoos are very important, have lots of meaning uh, to them. Um, these statues probably had, you know, some subset of that that fit the canvas that they were working on. When it comes to constructing or building them, what tools did they use to carve the rocks and what were those tools made out of? Great question. Uh, I showed some photos of those. They're called, the, in, the, what we know ethnohistorically, they're called toki, which are um, hand axes. And what they consist of is small stones that are, you can pick up with your hand that are made of basalt. And, and this island is made of volcanic rock and basalt is a kind of volcanic rock. This particular material that they use the, for the hand axes is slightly harder than the material that they're carving. So if you have a slightly harder material and you chip at the slightly softer material, eventually that material will sort of fall away, uh, enabling you to carve them. And we can find um, these toki laying around as well as the sharpening that they did in order to keep them um, you know, effective tools. Uh, by chipping away and making sharp edges. I think this sort of addresses the next question, but one of our students are wondering, are each of the statues made out of the same types of rocks? That's a great question. Um, well, about 95% of the statues are made out of, out of rock that comes from Rano Raku, which is the, the statue quarry. It's a volcanic tuff, which is a compressed ash, uh, which isn't super hard that they're able to carve these statues out of. But there are actually two other sources of rock that people, carve, well, three other sources of rock that people carve statues from. They, they carve statues from that red material, which is called red scoria that the hats are made out of. So we sometimes we find whole statues made out of the red material. We find statues made out of basalt. So if you, if you look online at the British Museum, the statue that's housed in the British Museum right now um, is made out of a very dark rock, a very hard rock uh, known as basalt. And then there's, um, uh, uh, um, uh, one other uh, uh, material uh, that statues are made of, but there's usually much smaller numbers of that kind of material. Most of the statues are made out of ash, compressed ash. I know you've addressed, addressed this one previously, but we're quickly wondering how tall are the statues and can we typically see the whole statue? When the statues are, the statues can be up to three stories tall uh, uh, and, and then just three story buildings, um, very large. Um, when the statues are at the quarry, many times you only see parts of them. That's because they're not finished yet. Either they're still in the, they're still being carved, so the bodies aren't visible, or they've been carved and brought to the base of the of the quarry, placed it upright in the pits so that they could finish the back side of it, and then dirt is filled in, whether purposefully or over time that's filled in. So we only see just the heads, but they all have bodies beneath them. When we, when we go beyond the quarry, when we go out into the, to where the Ahu are, uh, where there's about 400 statues outside the quarry, we can see the full bodies of the statues because they were placed on top of platforms and we can see everything. But so we know that all the statues had bodies. Um, it's just that sometimes we only just get to see the heads. From more of a cultural perspective, when these statues were being built, um, what types of animals did the uh, people have at that time? Were they surrounded by what? What types of animals were within that culture? Interestingly, uh, on the island itself, uh, when people first arrived, this is about 1280, um, really the island was inhabited by birds, uh, different kinds of seabirds. And um, you know, along the shore, there were sea mammals. Uh, but people brought with them a couple of animals, the, the rat, the, uh, this small little rat, arboreal rat called Rattus excellence, Polynesian tree rat. Uh, they brought chicken um, and um, uh, but nothing else. Uh, th those were only the two animals that they brought with them. So what happened is that people ate birds and they, they, you know, they were something that they hunted, uh, but survived animal-wise on, on either the chicken and rat. Actually, rat was probably a source of food, protein that the islanders used, but there weren't other kinds of animals. They didn't have horses, they didn't have dogs, they didn't have pigs, uh, and, and other, other animals that Polynesians might have had and brought with them. Uh, all the animals they had, they had to have brought themselves. So they only, you know, what was on there was really what they brought with them. And for our last question this morning, um, we have someone who wrote in and asked, were any other statues constructed besides what we typically see as the Easter Island structure or within your virtual background even? 
were there other statues constructed Wait, the besides the the ant what would resemble as their ancestor where the ancestor is the only type of oh, structure it, that's a good question there are interestingly there are small other figures that people carve so in addition to these giant huge communal scale statues you find a, an a, interesting array of carved arts people these were artisans you know they had that had you know limited resources to work with this is an island of rocks with different kinds of rocks and people made a, a lot of that carving different kinds of figures different shapes um, had sort of an elaborate cultural tradition of different kinds of carving. Uh, you know, the big ones are really consistently like the, you know, when it, they're communal efforts, they tend to look like the ones that we see in the background here. Great. Well, Carl, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome very much. No problem. All right. At this point, uh, Stephanie, please take it away and uh, wrap up for today's presentation. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. And what fascinating information that's been shared with us today. Definitely love seeing all the questions archaeologists are asking and the tools and the ways in which they're uh, really undergoing the process of science itself and answering those questions. Very interesting. Thanks, Carl, for all of the insightful look into these amazing statues. Um, we would love if you take a moment to complete the survey that is in the chat box. I've once again placed it there for you now at the conclusion of today's program just to let us know how we're doing. Also, um, we would finally like to just share with you our websites, both Mounts Botanical Garden located in West Palm Beach, <clears throat> Palm Beach County, and the Scientist in Every Florida School program. You can learn more about our programs through social media, on our YouTube channels, and you can find a recording of today's session on the UF Earth Systems YouTube channel as well. Uh, we're looking forward to our next event together, which is scheduled for March 2nd at 10 a.m. where we'll be talking about bamboo, the all-purpose wonder plant. So be sure to join us then. And once again, have a fabulous day and thank you for joining us today. Take care, bye-bye.